Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a meaty middle about all the words we use to describe a vacation, and a familect story about why some people call green peppers mangoes. But first, support for today's show comes from Magoosh. Do you need to take a standardized test, like the GRE, GMAT, LSAT, MCAT, or SAT? Magoosh Online Test Prep will give you the tools you need to get a great score, like study schedules, up-to-date practice questions, video lessons, and support from expert tutors. Study anywhere, anytime, on desktop or mobile. Visit Magoosh, M-A-G-O-O-S-H, dot com, and enter the promo code GRAMMAR for a 15% discount. That's Magoosh dot com and the promo code GRAMMAR. Late July and early August are the height of vacation season in the United States. Highways are jammed, pools are packed, and campgrounds are at capacity. With that in mind, let's talk about the word vacation and other ways to talk about taking time off. The word vacation comes from the Latin word vacat, which is the principal stem of the verb vacare, meaning to be empty or free. Other words that come from the same root are vacant and vacancy, as well as the obsolete words vacantry, meaning idleness, and vacatur, meaning an annulment. Although people have surely been taking breaks since the beginning of time, the word vacation doesn't show up in print until 1386 in Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. In his poem, the wife of Bath describes how one of her husbands had a book about wicked wives. The book tells about the most notorious wives in history, including Eve, Delilah, and Clytemnestra. The husband spends all his free time, his laser and vacation, reading the book aloud to her as a form of torment. And by the way, don't worry about the wife of Bath. She winds up ripping some of the pages out of her husband's book, hitting him in the face, and convincing him to give her all of his estate. On another topic, I've talked before about our seemingly endless appetite for creating portmanteaus, words that mash together two parts of other words to make something new. Examples are spork, which combines spoon and fork, and smog, a combination of smoke and fog. Well, people have also come up with some fun portmanteaus related to vacations. There's staycation, time off when you don't travel, but stay at home to relax, do projects around the house, or enjoy the sights in your own hometown. There's vacation, a vacation you contrive to take by falsely calling in sick to work. There are even brocations and mancations, guys-only getaways, where you get to do whatever it is guys do when they get together. Then, of course, there's glamping. This unmusical word is a mashup of glamorous and camping. It describes a luxurious outing very different from what you may have done as a Boy Scout or Girl Scout. Think of relaxing in a safari-sized tent built on a wooden platform, sleeping in a four-poster bed with linen sheets, checking your phone via Wi-Fi, and sitting down to a gourmet meal provided by a personal chef. That is glamorous camping indeed. There's also a shortened word for vacation, vacay, V-A-C-A-Y. That's now an official entry in the Oxford English Dictionary. If that upsets you, remember that dictionaries don't exist to validate new words. Rather, they document new words that are being consistently used over an extended period of time. That said, vacay is definitely a colloquial term. It's fine in conversation and in writing that has a casual tone, but leave it out in your formal writing. Another super short way of referring to time off is R&R, with an ampersand between the two R's. This initialism is military shorthand for rest and recuperation or rest and relaxation. There's another expression for being out of town or unavailable that we hear a lot, at least in the business world. It's being out of pocket. This phrase sounds like newfangled jargon, but it actually appeared as early as 1908 in a short story by American author O. Henry. 
There's a similar phrase, out of commission, that suggests that someone is not available, no longer around, or taking an extended break. This expression alludes to a ship that's been taken out of operation for repairs or held in reserve indefinitely. Finally, there's the way British folk refer to their vacations. They talk about being on holiday. And fancy folk in general, they talk about weekending at different vacation spots. Once again, that's a phrase that sounds like modern jargon, but was actually in use in the early 1900s. I guess some things never change, like our habit of turning nouns into verbs. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Before we get to the mystery of mangoes, today's episode is supported by Audible. Listening makes us smarter, more connected people. On Audible, you can listen to bestsellers, business, self-improvement, memoirs, and more, all professionally narrated by actors, authors, and motivational superstars. Audible members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook, plus two Audible originals you can't hear anywhere else. Members also have unlimited access to audio-guided fitness and meditation programs, plus free access to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post delivered daily to the Audible app. Access Audible on any device. It'll always pick up right where you left off. I've been a subscriber for more than a decade, and I love Audible. It's part of my life. It's easy to listen and learn or be entertained wherever you are. Right now, I'm listening to The Calculating Stars, which is read by the author, Mary Robinette Cole, and through her narration, I feel like I'm getting an insight into the characters that I wouldn't have gotten by just reading the book on the page. You can start listening with a 30-day Audible trial, and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash gg or text the letters gg to 500-500. That's audible.com slash gg, or text the letters gg to 500-500. Today's episode is also supported by Proactive. You might be heading back to school, but you don't have to worry about breakouts anymore. I remember the horror of having zits on the first day of school. Well, Proactive is America's number one acne treatment, trusted to fight acne for almost 25 years. Their newest offering, Proactive MD, is the first prescription-strength retinoid that's FDA-approved for use in treating acne without a prescription. You don't have to go to the doctor. It actually affects the growth of cells and decreases acne inflammation. Start school with one less thing to worry about with the help of this innovative next-generation acne treatment. And right now, I have a back-to-school offer from Proactive that you can't get anywhere else. With your Proactive MD order, you'll also get Proactive's on-the-go bag, including T-Zone oil absorber, body acne wipes, and green tea moisturizer, all free. That's close to $100 value, and and I love that green tea moisturizer. Plus, you get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Just go to Proactive.com slash grammar. That's P-R-O-A-C-T-I-V dot com slash grammar to order and make the first day back to school the best day ever. Next, I got this interesting voicemail from a listener that is half familect story and half question. Hey, Grammar Girl, I have what I think is a family story, but it could be just a local idiom. I'm not really sure at this point. I grew up in eastern Ohio, where we have a really odd dialect, but my family growing up always used the word mango to mean a green pepper. So I didn't know that mangoes were a fruit and a tropical fruit at that. Well, fast forward to years later, when my nephew was having his first birthday party and my husband and I had discovered that mangoes are indeed delicious tropical fruits and that mango ice cream is really tasty. So we ordered a, an ice cream cake for the family and we ordered it with mango ice cream. And my father was appalled. He said, I know you eat some weird things, but 
mango ice cream, and then I realized that my father was thinking it was green pepper flavored ice cream. Um, not quite, but I never knew where the word mango came from in that sense. And my family has never been able to figure out why we and other people around us called green peppers mangoes. Thank you. I had heard about this before, but had forgotten about it until I got your message. People in what linguists call the West Midland region do sometimes call green peppers mangoes or mango peppers. It seems to be most concentrated in Illinois, Indiana, and like where our caller's from, Ohio, although it's occasionally heard in other nearby states, too. The story is that long ago, mangoes seemed to have been a term more generally used for fruits that were pickled. And yes, as an aside, peppers are technically fruits, not vegetables. One theory is that when mangoes were first imported from India, they had to be pickled to make the journey. And by association, some people started using the term mango to refer to any fruit that was pickled. A different story uncovered by Indianapolis star food writer Donna Siegel is that in England in the 1700s, quote, there was a demand for Indian-style pickles like fruit mangoes stuffed with spices and kept in a vinegar brine, unquote. But at the time, mangoes had to be grown under glass in England, so they weren't widely available and cooks began using green bell peppers instead. Apparently, Brits who traveled to India were enthralled by mangoes. For example, according to Jane Grigson's fruit book, John Fryer, a surgeon for the British East India Company in the late 1600s, returned to England and wrote that, quote, "...the apples of Hesperides were nothing but fables to a ripe mango. For taste, the nectarine, peach, and apricot fall short." Unquote. Now, it's hard to imagine that a green bell pepper could adequately substitute for a mango, but that's the story I found in more than one source, and supposedly when English cookbooks were printed in America, they spread the concept of calling green peppers stuffed mangoes. On Google Books, you can easily find recipes from the late 1800s and early 1900s for mangoes that call for red or green peppers and other fruits. For example, the Housekeepers and Mothers Manual from 1895 has recipes in its pickling section for pepper mangoes, melon mangoes, and peach mangoes, which are pickled peppers, pickled melons, and pickled peaches. The Oxford English Dictionary has an example that reads, quote, The peaches may be converted into excellent mangoes, unquote and it even shows that mango was used as a verb in the late 1700s to describe pickling something. The example sentence is, quote, to mango cucumbers cut a little slip out of the side of the cucumber, unquote. People who travel to or move to the West Midland region comment on the strange name for green peppers. According to Don Mitchell in an article for the Indy Star, quote, grocery stores in the region tried to appease both camps by advertising green mango peppers, unquote. Thanks again for the question that sent me on the hunt of this neat regionalism that ended up letting me imagine 17th century British nobles growing mangoes under glass. Call and tell me your family act story. That's a word or phrase that you think only people in your family use. Sometimes it turns out that you aren't the only one, like today, but it's still made for a fun segment. The number to leave a voicemail is 83-321-4-GIRL. I'm Mignon Fogarty, Grammar Girl and author of the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. And I'll be back Monday night with a rundown of the differences between egg corns, spoonerisms, malapropisms, and mondegreens. And more. Thanks to my audio producer, Nathan Sims, and this show is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network. So check out some of our other shows like Everyday Einstein, Get Fit Guy, and The Nutrition Diva. That's all. Thanks for listening. 